Hello, my name is Chris Smith, and my presentation today is entitled Sounding History in a Pandemic Spring, Rebooting Research in a Changing World. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share some details of my experience during the Spring 2021 Humanities Center Faculty Fellowship course release, and I'm likewise very glad to express my sincerest gratitude to the Center for that support. Spring 2021 was nothing like the semester that any of us anticipated, but I hope that by sharing some details and possibly some insights which emerged from my own experience of that semester, I might be able to stimulate useful conversation and ongoing dialogues about ways to rethink what it is that we understand ourselves to be doing. COVID-19 and its worldwide human psychological and financial trauma have demanded that we reconsider what we do as teachers, public intellectuals, and global citizens. During a Spring 2021 Humanities Center Faculty Fellowship, inescapably solitary reflection made me rethink many aspects of professional engagement, from international travel's carbon footprint to the neoliberal university's human and financial costs, and also many kinds of privilege. In this presentation, I hope to share some of the outcomes of that critical self-reflection upon my own return to teaching in a conscious effort to look with healthy skepticism at how we do things. These include pedagogical delivery methods and assessment tools, student and staff support networks, research activities and the obligations of citizenship, travel, service, institutional funding and transdisciplinary collaboration, the necessity of new patterns of work, evolving strategies and values inherent in research agenda and professional profile, and new arenas and new partnerships. In my own case, and through the Center's generosity, I was able to seek new scholarly outputs in Zoom conferences and public writing on dance, anti-colonialism, and post-authoritarian recovery. A Musician's Vita lists selected performances, but in this COVID year, it was the pandemic itself that selected my performances as I found myself shouting into the void over Zoom, playing solitary banjo in silent six-foot distance neighborhoods, or via Facebook from truck stops. And I wrote around 250,000 words, forcing a more immediate authorial voice through the technology of voice to text on a number of projects, including a big co-authored monograph on music as labor, energy, and data in the Anthropocene era, which is now nearing its environmental endgame, between 1600 and the present. I'm still thinking about how I responded and why. I was very grateful to receive the faculty fellowship. At the time that I proposed this project, my primary expectation was that I would use the course buyout for additional writing time and a particular challenge, travel for collaborative and research purposes, which at least in my case, a very full teaching schedule typically precludes. In the event, of course, COVID-19 intervened and significantly shifted how I approached time, travel, and the generation and assessment of research outputs. As we all know, in terms of our individualized research agendas, some years are fallow, some years are fruitful. Just as with a harvest, the fruitful seasons can be damn demanding in order to get everything trucked away and bedded safe in the scholarly barn. And my hope for the fellowship was that it might represent a semester in which travel and time to think and write were vastly expanded due to the course release. I taught my last in-person class on March 13th of 2020. I taught and conducted my ensemble and all my service duties online in the fall of 2020, and I was on the Humanities Center course buyout in the spring of 2021. Though my compulsion to be available for grad students and colleagues who need help meant that I still spent a hell of a lot of time on Zoom and email, even during that fellowship semester. And let me tell you, if you think teaching on Zoom is like shouting into the void, imagine trying to conduct an ensemble via that same one-way digital vacuum. There are no upsides to a pandemic, but even adversity can teach us things about adaptability, resilience, and what we are going to insist upon retaining or letting go. Looking back, post-vaccination and in the finally arriving light at the end of the tunnel, I have approximately zero desire to return to how things were in the before times. The pandemic showed us the unsustainability of a whole range of norms. As I've resumed teaching in the fall 2021 semester, I've made a conscious effort to look critically and skeptically at how I and we did everything in terms of pedagogical delivery methods and assessment tools, in terms of how I understood necessary research activities, especially travel, 
in terms of my expectations around institutional support and transdisciplinary collaboration. The extraordinary demands of COVID-19 meant that I could not, in good conscience, simply abandon my service duties in the spring of 21 at a moment when colleagues, units, and most of all my students were struggling to cope. At some level then, unexpectedly, the Humanity Center Senior Faculty Fellowship made it possible not for me to research and travel, ha ha, but for me to research and continue to serve at an extraordinary moment of systemic crisis. I was able to treat this as an opportunity to set new patterns of work, to chart new stages of a research arc which is moving into the twilight of my career, to reassess and recalibrate my professional profile and identity, and to engage in new arenas and with new partnerships. And for all that, as I say, I am very grateful. In a moment, I'll talk about my primary research project for the spring 2021 semester, which maintained the same basic outline described in my fellowship proposal, and in fact expanded and led to new and evolving areas of research and engagement. But before I do that, I want to talk about the service obligations, which the course buyout unexpectedly permitted to maintain in order to help others. Absent that course release, which most fortunately I was able to cover with one of my own recent PhD graduates, Jonathan Verbaten, who did a stellar job in very difficult circumstances, I would have feared that my ability to serve would either be eroded or else would risk obliterating my research agenda. The Humanity Center's generosity made all of this instead sustainable and possible. Thus, I can say that during the fellowship season, I was able to give additional effort and attention to three FADP doctoral dissertations, namely Ying Zi Huo's From Solidarity to Divergence, Music, Race, and Identity of Chinese and African Immigrants in America, 1865 to 1930. Rod Huo, a PRC scholar and a musicology TA, was working on conceptions and perceptions of Chinese identity in the era between the Gold Rush and the Great Depression. This is a highly original piece of doctoral work, which, as a bilingual and bicultural interdisciplinary scholar, Rod was uniquely positioned to author. He's now a finalist for a postdoc in Asian Studies at Dartmouth. Roger Landis, The Sound Continues, Folk Dance Musicking in European Drone Music Revivals, 1975 to Present. Roger, a longtime full-time instructor for the School of Music, authored an original ethnography-based study on the historical dynamics of revival, also implicating post- and anti-nationalist folk music research, elective communities, and the interface of music and dance. I'm pleased to report that not only did Roger defend his dissertation in July, but also that this defense and his resulting completion of the PhD enabled his recent advancement to the continuing post of senior lecturer in the School of Music, a much-deserved recognition. And Rebecca Ballinger in Arts Administration. Marketing the musical, utilizing strategic marketing to grow audience sizes and present controversial material in Christian higher education. Rebecca, whose document supervision I inherited upon the retirement of School of Music Associate Director Michael Stone, authored an exceptionally comprehensive, thoughtful, and rigorous professional practice document on community, content, and public perception in Christian mission-centered higher education arts programming. This was not a topic about which I knew much at all, but as can happen in the best supervisor-candidate relationships, I learned a great deal while she did this work. She's now director of programming for a long-running concert organization in Kansas City. These three defenses joined three additional dissertations defended between June and December of 2020 for a total of six documents supervised and passed in the calendar year which encompassed the fellowship semester. My premise in maintaining this particular service, though I was given the option of suspending those duties or passing them to a colleague for a semester, was that my good fortune in receiving a Humanity Center course buyout should not rebound against doctoral candidates who are working hard to finish. In addition to the monograph project about which I'll speak, I was also able to engage in a series of scholarly outputs in terms of additional publications and presentations. While it's likely that I would have made the deadlines in any event for the print work, it's only through the odd synchronicity of the fellowship's course buyout and the COVID-19 pivot to online conferencing that I was able to engage so widely across a number of scholarly communities. My expansion of that engagement was intentional as a strategy for helping both myself and others cope with the pandemic's impacts. These included the following publications. Hashtag Dancing is Not a Crime, Dance as Digital Resistance in the Transnational 21st Century. This is a special issue themed dance and protest in a popular music studies journal. 
My article looked at the phenomenon of Iranian hijabis who choose to uncover their hair and dance in public contexts and to release videos of this dancing, and more widely at subaltern confrontation of theocratic repression, which seeks to stifle transgressive resistance and performance. Against the grain and out yonder, decolonizing the music conservatory via vernacular pedagogies. This is an outgrowth of an Italian conference presentation which I'd proposed in the pre-COVID era, but which was pivoted to online delivery. Giving the paper on Zoom for a diverse multinational and multi-time zone audience brought about the request to submit to the journal. The essay is a root and branch critique of traditional methods of teaching arts practice, using the example of a devised, student-centered, immersive theater partnership, which was stopped cold just before its April 2020 premieres by COVID, but is now potentially reborn, through the intercession of a major NEA grant slated for spring of 2023. And an alphabet soup for the arts, going big in the Biden-Harris recovery. As we all know, public events impact our thinking and our research agendas. Having published a column on dance in the November 6th celebrations in the Washington Post in 2020, subsequent events early in the new year of 2021 led me to think hard about post-authoritarian social recovery and the meaning of the performative in public discourse. As I've said, it's been my experience and conviction that COVID-19 and its worldwide human, psychological, and financial trauma demand that we reconsider so much of what we do as teachers, public intellectuals, and global citizens. That being the case, critical self-reflection in turn led me to radically rethink many aspects of professional engagement, including most notably the carbon cost and the hierarchical iniquities of conference travel and participation. The idea of traveling by international jet for a 90-minute conference panel and a few cocktail parties plus some local sightseeing, whether professional or personal, in an era of climate catastrophe, strikes me as the height of irresponsibility absent other considerations. That conviction is only heightened by my longstanding belief that models for professional travel support, which privilege the most senior and most visible scholars, while drastically underserving developing and minoritized scholars, graduate students, and the disabled, are simply indefensible. Out of a desire then to take advantage of the lockdown moment, I rethought my conference participation and sought those presentation opportunities which could both drastically lower my carbon footprint and strongly enhance economic and participatory access for all. These included the following, all online. Soundscapes of racial identity in newly American 19th century New Orleans. Jazz practice, group flow, and the immersive embodied continua of improvisational experience. Exiles of Ashanti and Connemara, Afro-Irish movement and music synthesis in the English Caribbean. Dancing in the street, public noise and music as protest in the age of Trump. A black fiddler on Massachusetts Bay, the sound worlds of Joseph Brown, 1749 to 1834. Dancing revolution in the Caribbean basin, expressive and revolutionary movement and moments in New Orleans history. The anti-hegemonic orchestra, rescoring Nosferatu from 1922 as critical collaborative arts practice. Solidarity Forever, massed song as proletariat resistance in the pre-World War I Pacific Northwest. We are building the new society within the shell of the old. Punk rock dances anti-imperialist communities of resistance. And Out Yonder, immersive theater as anti-hegemonic pedagogy in the music conservatory. As a working musician and member of a worldwide community of working musicians, I can attest to the financial, professional, and psycho-emotional costs that pandemic lockdown inflicted upon all creative artists and audiences. Those costs are still present, and they continue to hurt. In the fellowship period, I played literally zero live gigs, either solo or with esteemed colleagues, with the exception of the fact that for seven months, I played a nightly solo concert of banjo music at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, from Lubbock or from truck stops in Ohio and Oklahoma, or from the banks of the Husek River, for an online audience that grew to be worldwide, ceasing only when the weather in the North Berkshires of Massachusetts grew so cold that I couldn't play outdoors any longer. Indoor or asynchronous solo performance didn't seem to hit in quite the same way. Walking my Lubbock neighborhood in March of 2020, I had been struck by the eerie quiet, first during the extended spring break, and then even after a return, which was fragmented and disorienting. Something about hearing human noise, and Clawhammer Banjo is definitely noise, in walking neighborhoods, at a moment when we were all distanced from one another, 
by six feet of physical distance or by a Zoom avatar screen seem to be a meaningful and feasible grassroots expression of artistic citizenship. Not everything about Zoom sucked, however. I hated being unable to be in a room with my students and colleagues. I hated having to shout into the void of a webcam and to look for tiny emoticons or shifts of expression in one-inch windows. Yet I loved being able to participate in arts events and scholarly meetings staged by other citizens who were likewise attempting to maintain and even to empower or transform community in the face of the pandemic. And I was happy to contribute to such efforts. And that contribution continues, I hope, with the authorship and co-authorship of three major grants. One to the NEA for their growing arts programs. One to the NEH for digital humanities at colleges and universities. And one to the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council. My major performance effort for spring of 2021, the immersive site-specific theater piece Yonder, a collaboration with the historic Wallace Theater in Leveland, Texas, had been forced to suspend operations in March of 2020 after a year of preparation and less than four weeks before our April opening night. But the pivot during the pandemic led me to additional collaborators and to authoring a grant with the exceptional expertise of the TCVPA grant writer Kelsey Jackson for an NE8 award which intends to restage genre, specifically now incorporating into the storyline the metaphor of pandemic terror and alienation in the spring of 2023. Our interim dean said something about Yonder, the Elegant Savages Orchestra, and the mysterious nation of Basanda that eloquently captured, more effectively than we had ourselves, why the Basanda universe matters. Quote, The Basanda universe is massive in scope. Dr. Smith and his collaborators have taken care to create narratives about the project that interweave ethnomusicology with major cultural revolutions, significant histories, gender and class theories, and concepts of group and self. What makes the Basanda universe so very important to education is that it provides, in the most innovative and imaginative ways, a safe space for students to take risks with their potential. As undergraduates, most students come to university from secondary school environments that reward conformity and acceptance. Such systems do not emphasize potential or risk. Dr. Smith, with the creation and caretaking of the Basanda universe, has planted, cultivated, and curated spaces in which students can learn with expert guidance to explore what they are capable of. Students who engage with the Basanda universe step into a culture that is inspirational, stimulating, and transformative, and none of that is the result of chance or luck." End quote. Likewise, as I've said, I was able to co-author, again with the exemplary assistance of Kelsey Jackson and my colleague Roger Landis, an NEH grant that would fund three years of the Voices from the Vernacular Music Center podcast, inaugurated in February of 2021, only a few weeks before the mandatory pivot. That grant, if awarded, will provide $148,000 in operating personnel and equipment costs and take the VVMC podcast into 2025. In this period, podcasting was a major new area of engagement and professional development for me. Having been a longtime producer and host of public radio broadcasting in various markets, I sought to develop a new expertise with the tools of this new platform, both for the VMC podcast and for a second which spun off from the Modnograph project, which had been the topic of my original Humanities Center Fellowship request. This second podcast, which partners me with a longtime friend and indeed former public radio colleague now teaching at the University of Southampton in the UK, originated as a kind of audio promotion for the big monograph. But after a very successful initial series of eight episodes, which permitted us to build what is in effect a small broadcast media company spanning continents, we're now developing a second series, which partners Texas Tech and the University of Southampton, and brings in additional partners in the areas of sociology, culture studies, and environmental sustainability. I can say more about podcasting as public scholarship and intellectual branding in the Q&A and in the comments. I can also mention in passing that as a kind of mental vacation, I drafted a second novel entitled Basanda and the Bolshevik Revolution. That manuscript at 99,000 words is in process of revision with a third sketched, while the first manuscript completed is with agents now. A couple of short stories, or actually ghost stories, emerged as well. And there was the ongoing, very large-scale alternative history Basanda universe of the Elegant Savages Orchestra, 
heard in this pandemic year as the Intergalactic Pandemic Popular Front Band circa 2046. But let me turn now to talking about the project called, under various titles, The Sound of Empires, A Global History of the Anthropocene. This monograph, which was the putative topic of my Humanities Center Senior Faculty Fellowship proposal, emerged from a desire to work with a distinguished colleague of years past who was tilling different fields than I as a music historian. Over the course of 14 years from approximately 2004 onward, I had exhaustively researched, drafted, extensively, and repeatedly revised, and finally published two sole author monographs on topics in American vernacular music history. 2012's The Creolization of American Culture, William Sidney Mount and the Roots of Blackface Minstrelsy, which actually won the TTU Faculty Book Award, and 2019's Dancing Revolution, Bodies, Space, and Sound in American Cultural History, both issued by the University of Illinois Press in their Music in American Life series. These were projects which, as their time frame suggests, had been years in the making, and they represented my best efforts to author original scholarship which could fundamentally shift understandings of two kinds of performance phenomena in history, about which I cared very deeply. These were intensely rewarding and intensely demanding projects, and the labor involved in authoring in exhaustive detail works which were dependent upon archival research and stolen moments of travel damn near killed me. By 2020, after Dancing Revolution had been published and had, to my satisfaction and gratitude, received several awards and very positive reviews, I was actually ready for a different kind of project. My esteemed press and its general director asked me if I might have a third monograph in mind, and like an out-to-pasture fire horse hearing in the distance the sound of the fireman's bell, I responded that I did. But I also quailed internally, as I did not feel at all confident that at the age of 61, I even had it in me, in terms of energy or motivation, to complete another seven-year monograph process. And so I began to look around for other kinds of research outputs, other kinds of intellectual, creative, and public engagement that might represent a rewarding alternative. I continued to scratch a creative itch by authoring retconned fiction set in the Basanda universe. I continued to write music for my School of Music elective ensemble. I continued to practice the late midlife crisis musical instruments, which were my latest obsessions. But the itch to generate new interpretative historiographic scholarship was at war with my sheer, sheer sense of exhaustion at the prospect of another seven-year single-author academic monograph. Moreover, while I very much appreciated and felt rewarded by my relationship with my university press, I was also interested in further expanding my public-facing scholarship. As an old public radio board operator and commentator, and the author, producer, and host of two different long-running world music radio programs, I simply believed that other kinds of engagement, particularly at my advanced career stage, might be both more rewarding and more immediately impactful. As so often happens amongst colleagues within a discipline, I followed the new publications and activities of friends and esteemed peers, and though I was not yet thinking of partnership, I was struck by the unlikely points of continuity between my own work on 19th and 20th century American vernacular music soundscapes and experience, and that of my old friend Tom Irvine, an American-born Haydn and Mozart specialist teaching at the University of Southampton, who had recently published an award-winning book on the first sonic encounters between China and the 19th century West, and with whom in the 1990s during grad school I had briefly shared that same late-night minimum-wage public radio announcer gig. It struck me that my work on the soundscapes of 19th century New Orleans, New York, and the Caribbean might show a methodological parity with Tom's work on the sound of the China-European encounter and upon the imagined soundscapes of 18th and 19th century Germany. And so on a visit to Tom and family in the southwest of England, following my annual spring semester field trip on Irish folklore to Connemara, he and I began to talk about the possibility of a large-scale work together. We actually tell the story of that encounter, and of the intellectual excitement it kindled in the opening preview episode of the podcast we brainstormed as a parallel stream and a source of collaborative energy to the big book. Subtitled Tom and Chris in the Rose Garden, this first pilot episode of the Sounding History podcast tells the story of our visit with my spouse to Mottisfont Abbey, a National Historic Trust site near Southampton, where, while Angie was touring the vintage roses, Tom and I sat in a hot, crowded canteen, under the noise of the pensioners and staff getting their tea and biscuits, and in the course of about one hour, hashed out the idea of a different kind of history of music in the Imperial West, shaped not by genres or personalities, but by places, encounters, 
and the successive expropriation, control, and exploitation of first labor, then energy, and then data. The project began as a monograph, but in a new mode for both of us, involving as it did co-authorship. It brought an immediate sense of shared excitement because we'd found the topic upon which we could collaborate, but also, not too far below the surface, a bit of understandable anxiety about whether our working methods and our writing styles could be made to mesh. Emerging in turn from these conversations and that sense of excitement, and from a desire to develop public-facing scholarship which could reach a wider audience, and, as Tom says, get the book into the airport bookshops, though at that pandemic moment it was difficult to remember what those shops even looked like, we also concluded that we might be able to draw upon our shared grad school experience in public radio via the new medium of podcasting. My own completely anecdotal observation about podcasting is that rather like banjo people or tattoo people, there are two kinds of people in the world, podcast fans and everyone else. Given our respective ages, both Tom and I are relatively late converts to the medium. And as I've previously observed about the diversity of gamers communities, for example, the range of consumers and of formats, venues, and topics for podcasts is much wider than a non-fan might realize. Moreover, and very significantly, those listeners' engagement is far more actively directed and intentional. Particularly attractive to us was the combination of our known skill sets in writing accessible prose, in delivering on a microphone, engaging in conversational discourse. But there were new skill sets as well. We needed particularly to recalibrate our respective registers and sense of presentational tone, not to mention the mundanities of old guys learning the new and purpose-built digital technology which makes podcasts sound good. So over the course of the pandemic, as all of we academics perforce became self-taught amateur audio and video producers, Tom and I met weekly on Zoom and then on the podcasting platform Squadcast to both talk and brainstorm, but also to literally rehearse what would be our shared on-mic personae. It was a little bit like being in a teenage garage band again, meeting in a small space, self-teaching ourselves new technologies, and riffing together as we began to develop a shared voice. And that, friends, is more or less where things stand. But I'd like to continue to offer just a few words of summary and on the more granular day-to-day -day workflow and practice for those who might find them useful before I move to a conclusion and a set of challenges. As part of my general desire to reflect upon both philosophical and practical presumptions which have formally shaped, might have constrained, or whose disassembly might free up my work, I'll offer the following. I think in assessing one's own workflow and creative practice, it's essential to think consciously and intentionally about one's own cognitive patterns. Many decades ago, before either the internet or the explicit visibility of the gig economy, in a book whose topic was, for the 1980s, rather atypical, I read in Marietta Whittlesley's Freelance Forever Successful Self-Employment, Don't Give the Day Job Your Most Constructive Hours. I found that insight equally true when I was building houses or working in restaurant kitchens. If I waited until evening after a shift and a shower to begin my own creative, authorial, or musical practice, I was too physically exhausted to even stay awake, much less be creative. And thus began my now decades-long practice of arising very early, hours before the dig gig began, and using those pre-dawn hours at a time sequestered from other distractions when the world was asleep. I taught myself Irish music that way, and I found myself doing it again in teaching myself new ways of writing. An erstwhile colleague is quite a cat fancier, and at one point in a conversation about time management and workflow, I said I was a proponent of feline scheduling. They asked what I meant, and I said, well, I just know that on any given day in a seven-day work week, there's a certain sequence of activities to be got through. I can't necessarily predict or dictate the specific number of minutes available for each of those sequential activities, and that's actually not the point. Just like a cat who wakes up, wakes the humans, demands to go outside, demands to come back inside to eat, then takes a bath, then curls up in a sunshine puddle, waking up to shift to another sunshine puddle, I can't know how long I'll be at any given task. I just know that in order to get things done and have a somewhat centered existence, I need to move through a certain sequence of tasks, eating or bathing or finding a sunshine puddle or another thousand words in a reliable and predictable way and with some centered time given to each. So 
During that period of time when I was both liberated from Zoom teaching by the fellowship and locked down at home by the pandemic, I inaugurated a practice of using voice to text in MS Word, essentially forcing myself to bring the concentration I would employ in a spontaneous lecture or a seminar discussion, dragging the prose composition moment by moment as a verbal improvisation into the microphone. I found that practice both exhausting and exhilarating. I found a new prose voice, first in that recreational narrative fiction, and then even moving into using the practice of voice-to-text in generating the big monograph's 1,500-word historical postcards. Further extending the feline practice analogy, I tried to place that verbal prose exposition at a consistent location within the day's sequence of events and to operate in consistent surroundings, which would facilitate consistent concentration and cognition, to make a practice of concentration upon the task at hand, and forcing the verbal voice to move out of the larynx and into the microphone and the digital converter and into the MS Word sentences appearing on the screen with sufficient celerity that the MS Word microphone stayed open. The Zen author Natalie Goldberg taught nonfiction prose writing by the notebook dictum, keep your hand moving. And for me, in the voice to text context, keep speaking so that the microphone stays active, took on much the same energizing role. At the same time, I'd urge that although we should not be shy about incorporating new workflow technology or practice, we should always resist the temptation of believing that the acquisition of new technology automatically facilitates the capture of words. What I've instead sought to do is to integrate new technology in ways that challenge my intellectual process, practice, and presumptions, and to use those challenges in turn to develop new, more liberated, and more inclusive ways of working. So. To summarize outputs on the Humanities Center Senior Faculty Fellowship, about a quarter million words, 38 podcast episodes, three dissertation defenses, three peer-reviewed publications, 11 conference presentations, and the struggle to imagine a new way of working, and the much bigger struggle of imagining how we all work, for what, and for whom, and to what end. In addition to the big picture questions about how and why we academics, humanities centered and otherwise, do what we do in research, teaching, and service, I've also operated differently on the ground, most notably by taking advantage of our discipline's crash courses and course corrections in terms of virtual delivery to both attend and present at conferences much more widely in terms of both geographic and disciplinary range, where in the before times it was always necessary to balance literal cost of dollars, of hours, of carbon footprint, against benefit. Do I really want to give another 20-minute paper to an audience of 15 people, most of whom would encounter my scholarship in other less costly media anyway? It's now possible, at least logistically, to move in a much more transdisciplinary and transcontinental way. That's been good in terms of both professional and intellectual contexts, and also in terms of pumping up the old annual faculty review. But again, the pandemic and its subsequent adaptations even the positive ones, have shown us just how much our scholarly and creative enterprises have privileged the powerful, the heteronormative, the white, the male, the senior scholars, and the wealthy. Our graduate, student, minoritized, and disabled colleagues are quite rightly saying, you bastards could have done this decades ago. And they're right. Many of you will know me across a variety of contexts as a rather outspoken person. Aside from personality flaws, I'm also that way because I believe that as a white, male, cishet, full professor, protected by tenure, privilege, and baked-in institutional injustices, I have a responsibility to be an outspoken person. Because if not me, then who? If not now, then when? Thank you very much.